and we are back. Okay, we've done a terrific job with fiction. You folks have done such a nice job of analyzing so many things so well. Um, I, I'm just tickled with, with the kinds of things that you've written and the responses that you've made to each other and such. So, so far, so good. But now it's time to move on. And when I tell you what we're moving on to, I, I can already hear the collective sigh. But where we're going from here is poetry. Now, important thing, don't let poetry frighten you. Right now, stop the, stop the video, stop me, and get yourself pencil and paper because you'll need to write some things down tonight. Okay, so, so get that right now, and then we'll go forward. Okay, ready? Here we go again. Okay, so, again, number one, don't let poetry frighten you. Don't be intimidated by it. Pretty much forget what you've done with poetry in the past. Okay, that's not what we're doing now. Our approach to pretty much everything we've done so far probably has been rather different from what you've done in the past. It's the same thing is going to be true with poetry. So trust me, please, don't be frightened by it, okay? So first and foremost, poetry is, is just a beautiful way of expressing ideas. But that's not what we're all about right now, okay? When you read poetry, this is critical. This is critical, okay? When you read poetry, read it the same way you read prose, the way that you read regular fiction. Don't read it line by line, but read it by the punctuation. Read it from, you know, the beginning of, of the, the sentence to the end of where that idea ends. So to the end of where you see a period or a semicolon or whatever. Don't try to read it line by line. You get into that sing-songy stuff and, you know, that's how poems in a sense are written, but that's not how the thought kernels come across to us. Poetry is really written in thought kernels the same way regular fiction is. So don't read it line by line. Read it by the punctuation. Critical. Okay? So no fear of poetry, and you're going to read it line by line. I'm sorry. You're going to read it by the punctuation, not by line, line by line. We're not going to talk about rhyme. We're not going to talk about meter. We're not going to talk about all that stuff that makes poetry so difficult. And we're going to have much the same kind of approach here as we did with, with fiction, where we're looking for you to come up with what it means to you, because if it doesn't mean something to you, then it doesn't mean anything. So don't be terribly strung out over what the ideas might have been for the poet. No, what it meant for you. Okay, we're looking at, or, or there are two major kinds of poetry. There is lyric poetry, which is poetry that touches the emotions and probably the kind of stuff you think of when you think of the word poetry. But there's a second kind of poetry, and, and that's what we're going to talk about in detail tonight. That's narrative poetry. And very simply put, narrative poetry is poetry that tells a story. It narrates, it gives us a story. Okay? So, that's what we're going to talk about tonight, is poetry that tells a story. I am dressed in, in uh, Oakland A's shirt and hat. Um, because we're going to start with a poem about baseball, eh, you know, the best of all sports. Oh, well. Um, and um, I have a son who lives in Oakland, so, you know, I have Oakland garb. Okay. And the poem goes like this. The name is Casey at the Bat, and here's how the poem goes. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood 4-2 to two with but one inning more to play. And so when Cooney died at first and Burroughs did the same, a sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to the hope that springs eternal in the human breast. They thought, if only Casey could but get a whack at that. They'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake. And the former was a pudding and the latter was a fake. So upon that stricken multitude, grim melancholy sat. For there seemed but little chance of Casey's getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all. And Blake, the much despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted and they saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe on second and Flynn a hug in third. Then from this gladdened multitude went up a joyous yell. It bounded from the mountaintop and rattled in the dell. It struck upon the hillside and recoiled upon the flat. For Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearings and a smile on Casey's face. And when responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. 
No stranger in the crowd could doubt. Twas Casey at the bat. 10,000 eyes were on him while he rubbed his hands with dirt. 5,000 tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. Then, well, the wreathing pitcher ground the ball into his hip. Defiance gleamed in Casey's eye. A sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather covered sphere came hurtling through the air. And Katie stood a Casey stood a watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by that sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the Benches black with people, they went up a muffled roar like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire! shouted someone on a stand, and it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visit shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He bade the game go on. He signaled to that pitcher, and once more the spheroid flew. But Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, Strike two! Fraud, cried the maddened thousands, and the echo answered fraud, but a scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold, they saw his muscles strain, and they knew that Casey would not let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lips, his teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go, and now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. Okay, so, you know, that's, that's a fun narrative poem. Okay, that's a piece of poetry, you know, and it's a narrative poem. So that's one that I wanted to share with you. Okay, another one that I also have memorized, but I brought the recording with it because it's pretty long and I want to get through it quickly. It's a cremation of Sam McGee by Robert W. Service, and it reads like this, and it's another neat narrative poem. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake Labarge I cremated Sam McGee. Now, Sam McGee was from Tennessee, where the cotton blooms and blows. Why he left his home down the south to roam around the pole, God only knows. He was always cold, but the land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell. But he'd often say in his homely way that he'd sooner live in hell. And on Christmas Day, we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold through the parka's fold that stabbed like a driven nail. If our eyes we'd close and the lashes froze till sometimes we couldn't see. It wasn't much fun, but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. And that very night, as we laid packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, and the dogs were fed, and the stars overhead were dancing heel and toe, he turned to me and Cap says, he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess, and if I do, I'm asking you that you won't refuse my last request. Well, he seemed so low that I couldn't say no. Then he says with a sort of moan, it's a cursed cold and a scot right hold till I'm chilled clear through to the bone. Yet taint being dead, it's the awful dread of an icy grave that pains, so I want you to swear that foul or fair you'll cremate my last remains. A pal's last need is a thing to heed, so I swore I would not fail. And we started on at the streak of dawn, but God, he looked ghastly pale. He crouched down the sleigh and he raved all day of his home in Tennessee. But before nightfall, a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in the land of death. And I hurried horror-driven with a corpse half-hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise I'd given. It was lashed to the sleigh, and it seemed to say, you may tax your brawn and brains, but you promised true, now it's up to you to cremate these last remains. Now a promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail has its own stern cold. In the days to come, though my lips were numb in my heart, how I cursed that load. In the long, long night, by the lone firelight, while the huskies round in a ring howled out their woes to the nameless foes. Oh God, how I loathed that thing. And every day the quiet clay seemed to heavy and heavier grow. And on I went, though the dogs were spent and the grub was getting low. The trail was bad, and I felt half mad, but I swore I would not give in. And I'd often sing to the hateful thing, and it hearkened with a grin. Till I came to the marriage of Lake Labarge, and a derelict le there lay. It was jammed in the ice, but I saw in a trice it was called the Alice May. I looked at it, and I thought a bit, and I looked at my frozen chum. Then here, said I with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. Some planks I tore from the cabin floor, and I lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found that was lying around, and I heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared, and the furnace roared. Such a blaze you seldom see. Then I burrowed a hole in the glowing coal, and I stuffed in Sam McGee. Then I made a hike, for I didn't like to hear him sizzle so. And the heavens scowled, and the huskies howled, and the winds began to, to blow. 
It was icy cold, but the hot sweat rolled down my cheeks and I don't know why. And an inky and a greasy smoke and an inky cloak went streaking down the sky. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with grisly fear, but the stars came out and they danced about ere again I ventured near. It, I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I'll just take a peek inside. I guess he's cooked, and it's time I looked. Then the door I opened wide. And there sat Sam, looking cool and calm, in the heart of the furnace roar. And he wore a smile, you could see a mile, and he said, please close that door. It's fine in here, but I greatly fear you'll let in the cold and storm. Since I left Plum Tree down in Tennessee, it's the first time I've been warm. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was at night on the marriage of Lake Labarge, I cremated Sam McGee. Okay, so that's another fun narrative poem. It's a poem that tells a story. You know other narrative poems. You know other ones real well. For instance, The Night Before Christmas. Okay, and if that's one you want to write about today, that's cool, or this week, that's cool. You know, that's a neat narrative poem. Other narrative poems in your book that uh, you could certainly read and write about this week, and I'll, you know, I'll write down what the assignment is, but I'm going to give you the pages and the poems now. The poem, Dog's Death, on page 548. Nighttime Fires, on page 561. Manners, on page 582. Hazel Tells Laverne, on page 596. And The Raven, on page 575. So those are one, two, three, four, five other narrative poems besides the two I recited for you and a third one that I mentioned uh, the night before Christmas, okay? So you'll have eight narrative poems to choose from for you to write about this week. Again, they're all poems that tell a story. Don't fight them. Read them by the punctuation, not line by line. Read them as stories. Casey, you know, if you, want, if you didn't catch it the first time, you'll have to rewatch the video. Same with Cremation of Sam McGee. Um, you know, you can rewatch the video or you can call either one up on, on, you know, just Google them and you'll have the whole thing fronted in front of you. Okay. But, uh, I'll post the assignment as to what you're supposed to do with these pretty much the same as always. And don't forget to bring in any personal experience, thoughts, feelings that you have about them because all of these things touch all of us. Okay. Have a good week. You're doing great.